Thank you so much, Aaron. I hope uh, I like Nora said. I hope you all can can hear me okay. And yeah, I'm in the in the car. Um, like Aaron mentioned, uh, I am a teacher, and my wife and I are both teachers. So we're on um, summer break right now, and we're actually up in Massachusetts, where I grew up. Uh, and it feels very apropos because I can't really turn the computer easily to show you, but we're in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, you know, site of witch trials, site of all kinds of stuff, um, which I hope will feel apt for the for the first poem that. I'll be reading from uh, complete sentences. So um, just before I read the first one, I, I again want to echo um, what Nora said, just to thank um, all of you for being here and for, for you know, giving us your time, uh, which is always such a gift. Um, and also to all the other readers and June releases, um, it's just awesome to be part of the Broken Sleep Family period end of story, but it's especially awesome to be um, with such a great group. Uh, in that cohort. And then lastly, thank you so much, Aaron, for not only, you know, putting this all together, but all you just do for, you know, Broken Sleep as a family, as a, as a publication, as everything. It's just really inspiring to see. Um, and so it's been a real privilege getting to kind of have that, getting to be part of that um, all the way through. So um, this first poem is uh, called, I was going to burn some sage for the people of this world, but I read an article on the internet saying it was a bad idea. And it's inspired by a mildly true story, which is that at my old job, which is actually only a few towns over from where I am right now, um, before I would walk into school, uh, the teachers parked in a big, long row of parking spots, um, all of which faced a local cemetery. So you looked at the headstones and then you went and made copies. I was going to burn some sage for the people of this world, but I read an article on the internet saying it was a bad idea. Also, I didn't have any sage to burn. Doing nothing is always easier. Ask the cop in the graveyard or the teacher who every day parks her car in front of legions of Massachusetts dead and goes to work teaching students about the history of witches, thieves, and revolutionaries. I meant for that poem to read that, like that the teacher is knows that doing nothing is always easier because you know they well behave so seldom make history etc but I, I worry it's open to that sort of reading where it's like oh yeah ask the teacher because they don't do nothing and it's like that is kind of a perception that teachers uh, struggle against because you know here I am in the summer right I have all this time off um you know but that's always there's always things happening um and speaking of things always happening this next poem um is one that I've enjoyed sharing a little bit before the pamphlet came out. Um, it's called Angel's Braille, and so I'll just read it. Christy's cat Maggie died today. She was in her teens and tired. My kids, my students, are in their teens and tired too. Some of them work at night, stressing about money and the future. How can I really ask them to do their homework when so many other things are pressing on their minds? They are not cats free to sleep days and stalk their way through nights like some secret disease that will kill you in your bed. They are too kind and work too hard for that. Tomorrow I'll cancel class for our bereavement. Even though it's Sunday and you don't cancel class in high school, that's not how it works. Instead, I'll write a poem where all my kids write elegies to Maggie in lieu of the day's lesson. Then, when one boy shares a line comparing Maggie's fur to the sound of waning rainfall, I'll just cry. I'm glad that one came uh, after Aaron mentioned um, getting packets, like one of his children getting homework packets um, over the break, because homework is uh, one of life's true difficulties, um, especially over a summer break like that. And I also like that poem also had that line about um, some secret disease. And I realized like a lot of some of these poems were written um, well before COVID, but I found myself writing a lot of poems about teaching during COVID, I guess, just because, you know, the way that time started to work um, made it more possible to kind of open certain doors for kind of, like, whereas maybe normally during the school year, I would have just been so in it that I wouldn't have written about it, that suddenly it became possible to step back a little bit more also from the space Nora explored of like sort of being at home and sort of being at work, which is very strange. Um, and so another thing that happened a lot in uh, the being at home part of COVID was watching a lot of like movies and TV shows, uh, including a Glee rewatch that we, my wife and I did. Uh, Christy, my wife is in the previous poem. Um, so this poem is called Middle School and it's definitely influenced by watching too many Ryan Murphy programs uh, while in quarantine. 
middle school. When you love wrong, your world ends. Fedra, 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 spotlight Telemachus detachment and singing. Ted Hughes gets to the end of his life and writes that monster book on Shakespeare. The movie Camp 2003 is over a decade away. American teenagers doing musicals have not yet been apotheosized in Ryan Murphy's Glee, nor has the spotlight's murderous intent fully revealed itself. And so we have the poet reading desperately uncarefully to feel something new. After translating Fedra and keeping the grave accent on the title character's name, among the only Frenchisms that survive in a limpid but maybe two level free verse version, the theater feels like the right place for Hughes to rip the heart out of his empty life, a la Jonathan Price's character's threat to bond in that late 90s franchise entry with the newspaper and the BMW. The threat will be carried out by another man in keeping with the tragic tradition. But that is less important than the unity across all these myriad texts and how they lie, sometimes musically, but always in full view of a kind of truth. The viewer gets to hold most of the time or touch a little, at least see it. Although once they do, it reels them in brutally to tragedy's machine. Old mug of Zippo lighters at the antique store, the fire going out in Fedra's eyes, jaundiced opposite of Rachel Berry's, Anna Kendrick's aqueous spotlit reflection round the iris on a held note, a thin annular structure, the jail like perimeter of the American school. I'm about to go back to teach in one soon, and all this cowardly intertextuality is to not deal with that fact. You know what's fucked is I did everything I would normally do at the end of last year but I didn't help my kids make their lit mag like I had done the year before. I forgot about it almost completely and for so it didn't happen. It's one of the only places in school kids can lie freely with no trouble. Nobody reads it but them. And then they can be the reader for every piece other than their own and feel that glimpsing itch like writing will continue to haunt them until it has unknotted itself from the inside of their heart and lungs, which doesn't happen to everyone. Like, hey, Ted got stuck doing it, or maybe was cursed to do it through to the end. And that uh, Bond installation was uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, the you know, Jonathan Price vehicle, which is lovely. Cool. And we are very near a couple of antique stores in Salem. So the old jug of, uh, of Zippo lighters is also, you know, cinema verite as best I can manage it. Um, and yeah, I think it was interesting, Aaron said, you know, this pamphlet's about being a teacher because um, this poem has some of the most connections to my actual real life uh, students. There's a couple that are really close to specific students that I've had the privilege of working with. Um, and this one is called Truth and Love and it is, um, it owes its existence to the Malden High School Philosophy Club that I was lucky enough to advise for a few years. Um, so truth and love. There are a million things I should be doing right now that aren't writing a poem, so I will write a poem. I'm using an old note on my phone, so I promise the title is not premeditated. It's just something one of my students said during the usual Wednesday afternoon meeting of the Malden High School Philosophy Club. It was the start to her rejoinder, quote, so back to the truth and love thing, end quote. We had been discussing the question, what is love? And we could not agree if love was closer to truth or untruth. Like when Proust's jealous lover thinks Albertine is cheating, or when one student talks about how her sister says she loves her abusive boyfriend, even went back to him. She said, how can we know what it's like from the outside? I hear this and think about how no one would understand Lowell Stein if she explained herself. And then someone else says, sometimes even on the inside, you don't know. Like you could think everything's fine, but you're really hurting the person you love or you're calling something love that isn't. And now we are talking about labels, who can call what, what, and two students gesture at my bi pride flag during their stories about how they relate to that label, what coming out was like for them. The munchkins are almost gone and we agree we'll continue next week talking about labels. We haven't gotten to the bottom of it yet. Like the laundry pile, I should be putting away instead of writing this. Yeah, so 
my favorite part of that poem was uh, that when we were doing line edits for the uh, pamphlet, um, Aaron flagged the word munchkins. It was like, that's kind of an odd way to refer to your students. Uh, and I was like, oh no, because munchkins are uh, donut holes that Dunkin' Donuts sells around these parts. Uh, so Dunkin' Donuts is like ubiquitous coffee shop of the New England area. And I was like, oh man, this poem sounds really weird. Like it ends on such a strange note when I'm like the munchkins, you know, but no, they are, they are donut holes and they were a tradition at the Malden High School Philosophy Club and they almost always were eaten or taken by, by somebody. Um, and so I'm going to just read one more poem. Um, and before I read it, because I'm just going to um, mute and close out uh, after the end of this poem, I'm going to let it sit here. Um, but this poem uh, is dedicated in the memory of a, of a student that I had for um, a couple of years. I had him in my pre-calculus class, and then I saw him a lot in hallways because he was um, just, you know, a, a global citizen. He would always work uh, during the summers and help keep our school uh, clean and, and safe and everything. Um, so Jaden Brito White was was his name and um, we lost him to gun violence during one of my last years uh, in Malden and it's something that you know I don't know if the pamphlet's about gun violence exactly but um, I take very seriously the fact that I go to teach in a country where it's so possible for a student who is has their whole life ahead of them has done nothing wrong is the most you know golden soul you could think of um, and that could be cut short at any moment because of how how easy access to guns is in this country. Um, so this poem is in memory of Jaden, and it's called uh, CW Trees. Two days after Jaden died, I posted a picture of a question from the Arbor Day Foundation annual survey. Do you ever relax in the shade of a tree? Yes or no? Almost instantly, the pic got flagged and taken down, post removed for suicide or self-injury. I sighed, heavy, and continued my long rehearsal for a day without death.